God, thank you today again that we can come together, that we can meet uh, freely to worship you, to learn about you. Lord, we know that this world of ours needs you, and in fact, you are the only hope of all the things that, uh, that are put out there as the solution or the, the way to go forward. We know that there is only one solution and one hope, and that is you and what you've done for us. And thank you that coming up in Easter next weekend, we will be remembering that. And we pray that you'll help us to think through the, uh, the story, but also the implications of what it means for our lives over this week. Lord, we pray for our new government in New South Wales, and uh, we know that you put in place governments and you choose them. Um, they, don't, um, they don't just magically appear and they, they don't, don't sort of cajole their way in there. They, they are chosen by you. And so we pray that you will be guiding that government, that they will seek your, your uh, will, that they will understand um, what you say is good, and they will seek to impl implement that for the good of our community. We pray that they'll be a blessing to our community um, in everything they do. We pray for our local member, Clayton Barr, as well, that, uh, that he'll be representing this community fairly and reasonably and, uh, and truly, and that uh, yeah, we can be um, uh, yeah, well rep represented and proud of him as our representative in, in, in Sydney. Lord, we pray for our church and our, our church community. We pray for George and his family. Um, and we pray that you'll be just helping him to get over uh, the two, the heart attack and the stroke he's had this week. And for those, his family gathering around him, we pray that you'll be, um, you'll be giving them strength and, uh, and courage and they'll be yeah, really knowing and, and trusting in you, trusting that no matter what happens in this world, that you have um, the ultimate control um, in this world and the next. Lord, we thank you that Shirley's out of hospital and we thank you that, um, again, she's got people around her looking after her. We pray that you'll be giving her a speedy recovery. And equally, we pray for Tony and Vic, and thank you for their trip. That's going really well, and that they're off to Paris. And, yeah, mate, that have, we pray that they'll have a safe trip. They'll get, their all, get to Paris, and all their arrangements will work through, and that they'll be able to enjoy their time in France in everything they do, and that the trip will be a real blessing for them, both as they learn about... Um, the, the history in, in France and the war history particularly, but also as they spend time together and they learn about um, and they think about their relationship and their relationship with you. And we pray for our community ourselves and, um, and that we might be supporting each other and encouraging each other in our walk, to, walk together so that we can be a blessing to each other and a blessing to the people around us. We also pray for Isaac's upcoming trip to Fiji, that, they, that the U13 crew will be preparing well and, um, and that they might be um, yeah, really making the, getting things ready so that they can be a blessing to the churches over there in the Fiji that they'll be ministering with. We thank you that Isaac's doing that, that, uh, um, that, that course this year and we pray that it'll be a blessing to him as he learns more about you and more about what it means to be a Christian and how it, what it means to minister to others. We thank you for... All these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So today we are continuing in the sermon series on Luke, and we're up to Luke 5. So I'm going to read to you from Luke 5, starting at verse 12. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell to his face on the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for you in your cleansing and as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village uh, of Galilee and from Ju Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. So men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up onto the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles in the, into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. 
the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why do you think these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I say to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take up your mat and go home. He immediately stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do just ask that uh, your spirit who is present with us, according to your word, will be using your word as we reflect on it to make us more like you. I wonder if you know any stories about forgiveness. As I was reflecting on this passage this week, I asked someone if they knew any stories of forgiveness. And after a while, 10 minutes or so, I mean, they were busy doing other things, but they said, no, not offhand, I can't. I wonder if you have seen forgiveness. Where two or more people have owned their contribution to whatever the issue is, and they've apologised and they've asked for forgiveness and that forgiveness was given and relationship was restored. Maybe you were one of those people. I wonder if you know forgiveness. If you were one of those people and in that dispute, what was your experience of being forgiven? Was it a relief that further consequences and, and conflict were not going to be played out? Was it that coming together in reconciliation allowed for a fresh start and a joy in each other's company again? Rather than that horrible, awkward tension that was there when you were in their company. If you can think of a story of forgiveness, your own or another's, it's most likely going to be a pretty powerful story. If you can think, if you can't think of a story of forgiveness, it reminds us of how rare forgiveness is and is something as rare it is very precious. In verse 24 in this passage, Jesus says, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Just realize that should be a capital S and M in Son of Man. Sorry. Forgiveness is not an abstract concept, a nice idea. It is a noun and it is a verb, a doing word, and a powerful lived experience, whether you are offering it or receiving it. Is it not? In verse 12, if you have your Bibles open there, we'll see that a man comes to Jesus who is covered in leprosy. If this man came into the town, which it suggests there, he broke every rule relating to leprosy and social distancing. Yes, they were doing it 2,000 years ago, and it was probably more than a metre and a half, a lot more. If that was the case, it shows how desperate the man was. 
breaking the rules. Perhaps he did what they had to do. They had to shout unclean, unclean, maybe, as he heard Jesus was in town. Physically, that man with leprosy, he, what was happening was his nerve, his nerve endings are dying, particularly in his extremities, his fingers and toes. That's where it starts. And the flesh in his fingers and toes was slowly falling away. It also makes you susceptible because you can't feel to injury on those fingers and burning in particular. When Lauren and I visited India a few years ago, we spent some time in a place uh, where these ladies suffering from leprosy um, were, were getting burnt and all sorts of other things um, as a result of the leprosy. It's a pretty horrible condition. It leaves you with stumps where your fingers and toes were. And it can even progress beyond that. Socially, it meant that a person with leprosy must live outside the town by themselves. They were dependent upon people to, to sort of, you know, leave some food there and then go back and then they could pick it up stuff like that. As they were considered unclean and dirty, they could not participate in the Jewish religious life in the community either. And obviously, all this happening to you is going to have serious consequences for your own mental health. But he comes to Jesus, this man, and he falls He's with his face to the ground and he begs Jesus, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He didn't doubt Jesus' ability to heal, but he was not sure whether Jesus was willing. And it may not just be about Jesus' willingness to heal per se, but it, it's also... As, as you think, it's a reflection, actually. It, it's a way he could be expressing that he has this profound sense of unworthiness. And that might be why Jesus is not willing to clean him. Yet he does come to Jesus in faith and in desperate hope. Now, it's Jesus' turn to break all the rules regarding social distancing. And Jesus, we see, reaches out and touches the man with his hand. Anyone there would have been horrified to see this. It's a bit hard for us to appreciate the, the degree of what's happening here. This man probably hasn't been touched in years by anybody. I am willing. Be clean, Jesus pronounces for this man. And immediately the leprosy left the man. Jesus orders him, as we read there, don't tell anyone. But go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. It was very important that this process of these sacrifices be fulfilled because that was the testimony to everyone in town that he had been declared clean by the priest. See, with his physical healing authenticated, verified, approved and declared, announced by the priest, then everything changes. Then he can come back into town. Then he can come back to his friends. Then he could come back to the synagogue. Then he can come back to work. Then he can come back to the whole fullness of life in the community. 
and with a healthy mind. And perhaps for this individual, it meant coming back to his wife and her touch. The man was to be restored in every way. Jesus' healing is holistic, not just physical. News about Jesus continues to spread as more crowds come to hear Jesus and to be healed. That's a good thing, is it not? But it is draining in some sense for Jesus. It is work. And therefore there needs to be rest and refreshing in time spent with his father. And the same thing applies to us. And so Jesus, we see in verse 16, often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. If you remember, we read this in chapter 4. We see it here in chapter 5. We're going to read Jesus doing the same thing in chapter 6. In fact, throughout the gospel, we see Jesus going away to be by himself and with his Father in prayer. If God the Son knew the importance of making time with God the Father, how much more must we make time to be with God? In verse 17, we see Jesus is teaching again. And we see there that among the crowd there are Pharisees and there are teachers of the law. They had come, we read there, from every village in Galilee. In fact, they've also come the 200 kilometres from Judea and Jerusalem all the way up north to the area here of Galilee. You don't walk all that distance on a whim, do you? It's not a Sunday afternoon drive they're on here. These men are on a mission to find out who is causing all this fuss. Who's getting the crowds? Is he really healing people? What is he saying? And who does he think he is? That's why they're there. The Pharisees, they were the people, they helped maintain the purity of their religion by teaching the, the law of Moses and the traditions and how these things ought to be applied in daily life. That was their job. The teachers of the law were respected as having expert opinion and knowledge on details of the Jewish legal tradition. And so they're here, they're expected to perform, uh, to form an opinion about the correctness of Jesus' teaching according to what they know. And in verse 17, you see that phrase there, that sentence, the presence of the Lord's power there was present to heal. Now, effectively, that means God himself was there. And so we've got the religious leaders and Jesus there with the power of God, the scene is set. And so some men now come carrying their paralyzed mate. They can't get in the front door of the house because it's so packed with people. So they climb up on the roof and they start pulling it apart to make a big hole big enough to lower this paralysed man down right in front of Jesus. In verse 20, see, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. I think we're on the, the next one, Vic. The religious leaders are thinking there to themselves when he says that. Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? 
Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, they were correct as they answered their own question. It is only God that can forgive sin. Hang on. Yet, if only God can forgive sin, why does the Bible and Jesus in particular frequently call us to forgive one another? When we sin, we break God's commands, we break God's law, while we offend another person. Because of who God is, because he created us in his image to relate to him, and because it is God's law that we have transgressed, our, let's call it, primary sin is against him. While the people around us suffer, let's say, collateral damage in some sort of way. It's also, perhaps even more significantly, God alone who can not only forgive, but in particular, God alone can make us righteous, giving us right standing in relationship to him. When we forgive one another, we're not doing that. And this is what the religious leaders are thinking. That's what they're coming from. I'm going to mix metaphors here. So just think in our horizontal relationships with each other, we can use the language of forgiveness. It's okay because it should reflect what's going on in our vertical relationship with God. But. The breaking of God's law and therefore the, I'm going to use it, you know, a sine wave, a wave, right? So it, it's like the same thing but more extreme. So in breaking God's law, we the depth of the offence and then is much greater than the depth of offence to one another. And then it's higher in the sense that God can make us, not only forgive us, but make us righteous in right standing with him. So with God, our, our sort of, there's this thing of, of, of offense, and then there's this higher extreme of restoration. With each other, it's similar, but it's not as extreme. So yes, we offend each other, and we can forgive each other and restore. Hope that makes sense. So we can forgive what you can use that language of forgiveness. It's the same thing, but the degree to which uh, it happens with each other is not as great as the degree to which those things happen with God. And the Pharisees and the teachers did not like Jesus claiming his divine prerogative of forgiveness for himself. But then he just shows some more divine ability in verse 22. We read there, Jesus knew what they were thinking. <laughs> Only good can do that. Why are you thinking these things in your hearts, he says? Knowing who was in the audience that day, knowing why they had come to suss him out, and even knowing what they were thinking, Jesus wants to make a very clear point here. And with that paralyzed man there just before everyone laying on the floor, he asks everyone, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. The point Jesus wants everyone there and I think here too to be clear on is this, verse 24 again, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. 
So while saying your sins are forgiven or to get up and walk are in one sense equally easy to say, they are also equally impossible for the average bear to do. But in another sense, it's easy to say your sins are forgiven because that cannot be proved or disproved. To prove he has authority to forgive, Jesus says to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up. Pick up your mat and go home. And so immediately the man stands up in front of everyone. He picks up his mat and he makes his way home. And we see that he's praising God all the way home. He was forgiven and he was healed. And we see there also that the people are amazed, verse 26. And so what do they do? They start giving praise to God as well. The visible reality of Jesus' declaration, I tell you, get up, validates the spiritual reality of Jesus saying your sins are forgiven. And isn't it interesting that the paralyzed man and the crowd see God at work and they go off praising God. It's been a great day. Where the religious types couldn't or wouldn't see God. So far in Luke, we have seen Jesus displaying his authority in various ways. And this is not only the case in Luke, but in the, the, all four Gospels. It's really why the Gospels were written, because what they do is show Jesus' authority. They reveal who he is. And so far in Luke, we have seen Jesus showing his authority over Satan at that temptation. We have seen Jesus showing his authority in teaching where the people were amazed because he taught with authority, not like the teachers of the law. He showed his authority as he walked through his hometown crowd when they wanted to throw him off the cliff. We have seen him show his authority to heal all sorts of diseases and ailments. He has shown his authority over demons by driving them out and by commanding them to be silent. He has shown his authority over nature by that miraculous catch of fish. He has shown his authority to call disciples and for them to respond and follow him. And in this passage, we now see something different, another area of authority, Jesus' declaration and demonstrating his divine authority to forgive sin. This ability to forgive, which Jesus says he wants people to know that he can do, is perhaps the most important demonstration and sphere of his authority. Because forgiveness has earthly, spiritual and eternal consequences. When Jesus declares forgiveness, he is declaring that the broken status of relationship with God has now been made right. As the man with leprosy was fully restored physically, socially, religiously, and mentally, holistically, the paralyzed man has been restored physically and in his standing before God in being forgiven. And this can only happen through God's grace. It is reflected in so many wonderful passages and verses in the Bible. So many will we'll remember a lot of them. What about being washed clean, washed whiter than snow? Your sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. 
Your sins are buried in the deepest sea. They can never be brought back up. What about when Jesus said to that woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you, but go and leave your life of sin. What about when he said to that woman that that anointed him with that precious perfume and was weeping at his feet? What did he say to her? Your sins are forgiven. And that outraged the Pharisee whose home he was in. What about his restoration of the woman of Samaria there at the well? And she ran off to tell everyone, this man that knows all about me. Even to that repentant sinner next to Jesus on the cross as they're dying together. And Jesus says to him, truly I tell you, this day you will be with me in paradise. So many beautiful, that's a tip of the iceberg, examples of Jesus' forgiveness, the extent of that forgiveness. And when Jesus declares forgiveness over someone, it changes them. When a person repents and knows they have been forgiven by God and brought into relationship with them, it changes them. And Jesus gives us Two things, a really great help and a really great warning to help us understand the depth of his forgiveness and our response. One day he tells this story of a servant who had a debt so big he was never, ever ever going to be able to repay it it back to his master. When he begged for more time to repay, the master didn't give him more time. The master said, don't worry about it. You are never going to pay it back. So let's just forget the whole thing ever happened, shall we? And completely wiped it. Imagine that. You've got to repay 10 million bucks. You're never going to do it. You got yourself in some sort of mess. And the person says, just forget about it. Gone. How are you going to feel leaving that room? (laughs) Well, when this servant went out from his master and he saw a mate of his, a fellow servant that owed him a few bucks, he grabbed him. Jesus says he began choking him, demanding payment. And when that fellow servant then begged him for more time, the man that had just been forgiven so much refused that. And he had him thrown into prison until he could repay. I don't know how you can repay when you're in prison. But the master that had been so gracious and generous, heard about what this other servant did to his friend. And then he hauled him back in. And then he handed him over to the jailer. Jesus said to be tortured until he could pay back all that he owed, which was never going to happen. So it's a story, it's a parable Jesus tells to explain something. And then at the end, Jesus says, this is how my heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive your brother or sister. Well, 
or parent. Or perhaps adult children. Or your boss. Or your wife. Or your husband. And you better forgive them from the depth of your heart. That's difficult. I know that can be complicated, but it's pretty scary as well. It's, it's a strong warning Jesus is giving here too. And yes, I do realise there are some really, really horrible things that people experience to try and forgive it. It, it is complicated. And there's a whole other sermon in that passage. However, the point is pretty clear, isn't it? That when a person knows the amount that God has forgiven them, surely it's got to change them. Surely it's got to make them different. Surely it's got to make them more gracious and forgiving. Knowing you have been forgiven a mountain has to make you more willing to forgive a molehill. And you might be sitting here thinking, yeah, but if you know what he said. Well, yes, molehills come in all different shapes and sizes and some are bigger than others, but still relatively to a mountain, to what God has forgiven, they're pretty small. In today's passage, Jesus wants and he says and he shows that he wants us to know he can forgive that wall of offence that we have given him, our holy, pure, perfect God. So what do we read in 1 John 1, 9? Beautifully, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So if he can do all that for us, we have to find a way to do that for others, do we not? We will know the degree to which we have experienced God's forgiveness by the degree of compassion and forgiveness we offer others. So I pray that is part of your story. It was certainly part of Corrie Ten Boom's story. She says, It was in a church in Munich where I was speaking in 1947 that I saw him. A balding, heavy set man in a grey overcoat. A brown felt hat clutched between his hands. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat. The next I saw a blue uniform with a visored cap with its skull and crossbones on the front. Mary, memories of the concentration camp came back with a rush. That huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the centre of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment of skin. 
Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now, he was in front of me with his hand thrust out for me to shake. A fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there, but since that time, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fraulein. And out again came his hand. Will you forgive me? As I stood there, I could not forgive. Betsy, my sister, had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, horrible death simply for the asking of it? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespass, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Still, I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling, Lord. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one outstretched before me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother. I cried. I forgive you with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the depth, the amount, the mountain 
the extent that you have forgiven us. For all that know you and love you, Lord, that is a debt we could never repay. We thank you that you want us to know that you have the authority to forgive. And because of that, we can embrace that forgiveness. We can have that heavy load lifted off of our backs. We can walk tall, we can be in joy. And Lord, we must be grateful, oh so grateful. And show that gratefulness and that grace to others. Because you have called us to, but because you can enable us to, as you enabled Corey Timburn. Help us to do that in your precious name. Amen.